we have an exciting program ahead. Uh, so let me quickly uh, pivot to that. It's a pleasure to welcome Francesco Folpe and Chris Schmidt of Renaissance Fusion uh, to this uh, uh, Simon's Hour. Uh, they are very excited about the company's future and what they plan to do and requested uh, that um, they come and talk to us, which we are really honored by because they're going to talk to us about plans that most of us haven't heard about yet. Uh, most of you know Francesco and Chris. I certainly have known them for a while. Francesco was associate professor uh, at Columbia University before he decided to go on and um, found this company. And Chris Schmidt is also uh, a former postdoctoral colleague at the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, uh, albeit during COVID times, which made our interaction more limited than we or Chris would have liked. But still, uh, it was really fun having him around because he has a lot of interesting topological ideas and things that I have learned from. Uh, Francesco is an experimentalist uh, primarily, but does a fair amount of theory. So they both are people with strong plasma physics credentials. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to uh, just request them to share screen and move on with their presentation. Uh, uh, can you share screen? Francesco? Uh, yes, one second. I'll be uh, sharing the screen. Uh, okay, Francesco great. has a bit of a call, uh, call, so I'll be doing the talking. Uh, okay. Let's see, share. Yes, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, let's, oh, oh. Uh, give me one second. Let me remove the chat there. Yes. Very so, good, thank you. Yes, so nice to uh, thank you very much, Amitava, for that introduction. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about uh, our plans to build a Stellarator, which, uh, yeah, is very exciting and uh, indeed. Uh, so we've just filed the uh, patents on our core technologies, and that allows us to talk more freely about them and how exactly we plan to build the Stellarator. So I'm very excited to share it with all of you and announce uh, what we're going to do. So first of all, just a brief introduction. Uh, let's see. Yes, and let me remove the Zoom button there. Yeah, so there's been a recent explosion of startups and attention uh, towards them. Uh, and uh, this all happened uh, mostly like the last uh, decade with uh, several new companies being formed each year trying to make uh, fusion happen. And uh, But the first startups are already from the 1990s. Uh, and we are the latest in this line, but uh, something tells me there's even uh, more to come here after 2020. Um, but uh, yeah, so why is this happening right now? Well, it's a confluence of three different um, uh, effects. First of all, there's a strong market pull. We need a carbon-free load-following energy source and uh, fusion can uh, supply that. Uh, on the other hand, the technological readiness of fusion is, uh, uh, according to some sources, uh, estimated at TLR3. So that makes it uh, ready for industrial research and development. Plus, there are recent breakthroughs that make all of this, uh, that help with uh, all of this, including high temperature superconductors, advances in computing, in new optimization <laughs> suites, such as SimSop, for example, coming out. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, all these new technologies, all of this is coming together. And we also need to start commercializing now so that we can be, uh, uh, well, we need to start working now so that we can commercialize in the 2030s and then achieve the needed carbon neutrality by 2050 to prevent uh, catastrophic climate change. Now for uh, making fusion uh, energy work, there are two different approaches. You take something that works and you try to make it cheap which is uh, tokamak accelerators, laser fusion. These are very expensive, but very well studied. We know the physics of it. We just need to make it cheap uh, and so that it becomes commercially viable. That's what Commonwealth Fusion System, Tokamak Energy, is doing for tokamaks. And we in Type 1 and Helical Fusion in Japan are doing for Stellarators. Uh, the other approach is to take something that is inherently cheap, but very far from working, 
and to make it work. And that's all of these other concepts such as field reversed, uh, magnetic approaches, inertial fusion, uh, where there's so there's uh, about uh, 35 companies in the world right now uh, pursuing different uh, fusion uh, uh, strategies. Uh, and we filled a gap here uh, when Francesco launched Renaissance Fusion. Both the Stellarator row was empty and the Europe column was empty. Since then, it has been populated a bit more, but we fill a niche here being a European-based uh, uh, Stellarator magnetic confinement fusion company. So um, why... Why deuterium tritium fusion? Well, first of all, we all know why fusion, but deuterium tritium fusion is the most efficient, uh, has the uh, highest uh, cross section at achievable temperatures, but it comes with the problem of uh, neutron damage to the solid materials of the walls. Um, now, for a deuterium tritium fusion reactor, um, well, there are 24 companies pursuing that, the others are pursuing anatronic uh, means. Uh, but then uh, we uh, are together with three other companies uh, working on the tokamak and the stellarator concept, so magnetic confinement fusion. Uh, so this, these are well studied. We know that they will work. Uh, stellarators perform on the same level as the similarly sized uh, tokamaks, and we can predict how well they work. They are just uh, very complicated. To build. Uh, on top of that, the Stellarator has the advantages of being continuous, so there's no instabilities, no uh, disruptions. Uh, you turn it on and it can run indefinitely. Well, there's always a limit, but uh, uh, the Stellarator has all of these advantages. But all of these choices that we make also come with issues. First of all, the deuterium tritium fusion reaction uh, uh, creates uh, neutrons, and these neutrons can activate the solid part of the reactor. So the way that we mitigate this is uh, with liquid metal. So uh, stabilized liquid metal flow against the inside wall uh, that will absorb most of the neutrons. And the goal is to achieve radioactivity as low as in a hospital um, and um, long lifetime. So liquid metal will be coating the inside of our accelerator. Uh, then the problem with the tokamak and the accelerator are that they are, well, the ones that have been built, Eater, Wendelstein, uh, are very large experiment, uh, experiments. And especially in order to achieve fusion, they need to be very, very large. But the new breakthrough in high temperature superconductors promises to scale down the size of these uh, plants and also reduce capital costs. Now, the last... Uh, problem that we face is that the stellarator coils are, well, they're difficult to manufacture, that's, uh, that's uh, for sure. And we are, uh, we are planning a radically new uh, design and manufacturing method to make, uh, to make these coils, to make them cheap and transportable and scalable. And I'll go into details in all of these in the rest of the uh, presentation. But the three key points is we want to make them safer, smaller, and simpler to build. Uh, so first of all, how are we going to manufacture these coils more simply? Well, let's first look at how traditionally or traditionally there hasn't been a high temperature superconductor stellarator built yet. But how would one do that with uh, with these new HDS tapes? Uh, so these come in a very long strand of uh, superconductor deposited on Hastelloy with many, many buffer layers in between. And these are quite finicky. If you bend them too much, then the critical current goes down. And about six machines are needed in order to put all of these layers in the right order. And it's just this, uh, so the entire stack is about a tenth of a millimeter, but it's just four micrometers thick of this superconductor in the entire tape that carries all of the current. Uh, and it's a rare earth uh, Repco type superconductor. Now we have these tapes and they need to somehow be uh, put into the stellarator. So there's an intermediate step of making a cable. And here we show the Viper cable concept, where the tapes themselves are put inside of a groove. I actually have a video uh, showing this better. So that's uh, not that's not this video, but 
uh, one second this video. So the uh, superconductor is, uh, well, first, the tape is manufactured on the base of Hasselhoff, and in different baths, different buffer layers are made just so that that superconducting layer can have the properties that we need it to have. Now, I wanted to go to the cable making, which starts over here. Well, after all the manufacturing, we use a copper former. And inside of the grooves of the former, the, the tape is laid, uh, which is then soldered in place and uh, given a sleeve. And that cable is then used to create uh, your, your coil width. So a complicated 3D space curve is designed. The cable is wound around it. Epoxy and filler will be added to it together with the casing to give it the structural properties that it needs to withstand the forces as it is a stellarator coil. And then all of these separate sculptures, these 3D shapes need to be placed intricately around a vacuum vessel. And very accurately, millimeter precision is needed across the size of the entire device in order to uh, get the accurate magnetic field. Now, these um, HDS can also be used to generate uh, tokamak coils, which we demonstrate here at the end. But this process, it's very complicated. And this is what we want to simplify. So, um, and the way that we want to do that, I'll show in the next video. Um, and so we want to deposit the superconductor directly on cylinders, on structural materials of the vacuum vessel, because the deposition process, uh, well, you can deposit superconductor on on anything it doesn't need to be in that tape form so on the entire cylindrical surface we plan to deposit the same stack and uh, get the same uh, quality of uh, superconductor uh, but then uh, deposit the uh, the superconductor on a wide area now on that wide area give me one second there so having that deposited, we can define channels inside of the superconducting layer. And these channels will then channel the supercurrent. In fact, we're bringing back the coil winding surface. Uh, we don't have these separate, intricate, difficult to make coils, but we put the current directly on the surface and we define the pattern by a pattern of grooves by just removing a tiny amount of material from that surface to channel the current in the proper direction. So current can be flowing along the entire surface of the uh, of the coil winding surface, actually. So this is just an artist impression. This is not the exact current that would produce uh, the exact groove pattern that would produce the accelerator field, of course. Uh, we are working right now on uh, calculating uh, the, the pattern of grooves that uh, reproduces uh, different stellar rate configurations. And we will go more into depth in this uh, in uh, future slides in the presentation. But having this uh, solution, we can also uh, make different patterns on these cylinders or plates with white film and HCS deposited on it, such as MRI or energy storage devices or um, uh, even electromotors, if we make the proper coils on the surface. Uh, so these are potential spin-offs of this technology, but the core goal is to create the strong magnetic fields for, for a stellarator. So let's- Quick, uh, quick question, if I yes. may. Uh, have you settled on a manufacturer for this? Um, so this uh, deposition, we're planning to do um, in-house. Actually, we are uh, acquiring the machines to deposit our own uh, HDS uh, on different substrates. We'll be scaling up. So we'll be starting uh, not immediately with uh, huge several meter cylinders. But uh, yeah, we are planning to do manufacturing and proof of principle in-house. Understood. Thank you. So yeah, we're bringing back the coil winding surface and these are gonna be the modular pieces, the 
two per, uh, if we use stellarator symmetry, then two per stellarator field period or possibility even more or uh, fewer. We're still uh, working on finding the optimum there. Uh, but uh, the current will be flowing in the entire surface, so has many benefits. Uh, first of all, we don't have the field concentration around the individual coils, but also because we pattern with a laser, accuracy and placement becomes a lot simpler. So at least within a single cylinder, uh, the groove pattern, it, it's a kind of CNC milling. Millimeter accuracy on several meter scales is not an issue here. And the complexity of the pattern is also not an issue here. With these grooves, we can make tight turns, which you can't do if you take the cables. If you bend these cables to a tight radius, then uh, the superconducting properties of the HDS film deteriorate. That is not the case for a film here because we never bend the film. We only define the path through the pattern of grooves that we apply to it. So, so yeah, the different... Uh, options here in different videos, electromotors, uh, MRI machines, uh, for example, with the different spacing so that you get uniformity of the field, and of course, stellarators. Now, we are greatly simplifying the uh, coil winding surface, but if we look back at the history of the development uh, of the stellarator, um, the coil winding surface in uh, previous generations was already there. The W7AS stellarator, most of the coils lie on a simple toroidal surface with just the corner coils being larger in shape. Uh, it was when we moved to optimized uh, stellarators and W7X and needed very complicated uh, current paths that it was found that if we use a conformal surface, which is conformal to the plasma, that minimizes the coil complexity. But then again, the coil complexity is not as big of an issue in our manufacturing uh, paradigm. So we want to look at, can we make an accurate magnetic field uh, that reproduces a stellarator configuration with simple cylindrical or well, not exactly cylindrical, but I'll go into that in next slide, but in a much more simplified coil winding surface. Uh, and uh, that is one of the first things that we looked at together with uh, a brilliant uh, student, uh, L. This is uh, his work. So we take the existing uh, rec coil algorithm, which... Uh, if I may quickly ask you a clarifying question, uh, Robert. Of course. Nice question. Could you kindly define conformal in your previous slide? Oh, yes. Uh, so conformal, uh, well, we'll go into this a lot uh, more, but it's basically an expansion of the plasma surface radially outward. I know there's a much more precise uh, algorithm but uh, or a definition of it, but yeah, we take the surface normal of the plasma and we take a same distance step outward and then we get a new surface that is an everywhere the same distance from the from the plasma, so there's uh, it's to me. I know there's some intuition on this, but what exactly is the best surface? It's not exactly conformal uh, to get the lowest um, current complexity on the surface, but at least conformal surfaces perform really well. But the further away that we need to take the surface, for example, if we need to add a blanket or other materials, the more complex the current solution becomes. And that's also what we see here in this uh, initial study. So we take uh, the original coil winding surface of W7X and uh, a conformal coil winding surface with a low separation and uh, use the recoil algorithm. So it's a regularized solve for the optimal current potential on that surface. And it, uh, with the regularization factor has, uh, as, uh, as uh, the normalization here is the uh, chi-squared K metric, which is the, a measure for current complexity. So we get a trade-off. We want simpler solutions but then we get the, the simpler we want the solution, the higher chi squared B, or though the lower the uh, root mean squared B normal to the plasma surface that we're targeting uh, becomes. And for a single surface, we can look at that comparison. Uh, uh, 
So the more we weigh current complexity, uh, the uh, um, so yeah. So here we see in the green dot uh, the current the chi squared k that is needed to achieve a current solution of accuracy 10 to the minus 3. So the root mean squared b normal to the surface on the plasma boundary is 10 to the third of uh, the magnetic field on the axis for that equilibrium. And different surfaces perform differently in this trade-off, but in general, the further you put your surface away from the uh, uh, from the plasma surface, the higher of a current complexity penalty you have to pay in order to get that accuracy of solution. So you can choose 10 to the minus 4 or 10 to the minus 3 as your offset, and you get different current complexities. Now, we try the same thing for uh, much simpler coil winding surfaces. So here we see the conformal coil winding surface at different cross sections of W7X. But we can also draw an axisymmetric envelope. So that is the envelope that's at every point at least a certain distance away from the plasma boundary because we still need space for the uh, blanket uh, to fit in between the coil winding surface and the uh, plasma itself. Um, and so we look for uh, axisymmetric envelope surfaces and uh, conformal cylindrical envelopes. So um, this is the envelope that is, if you were to extrude this shape in a straight line, a coil winding surface that is at every point at least a distance d away from the surface. Now these are going to perform slightly worse than conformal surfaces. But the uh, surprising thing is, and the important thing is, that there do exist solutions, current patterns on both the cylindrical envelope and the axisymmetric envelope with uh, either 10 to the minus 3 or even 10 to the minus 4 accuracy that reproduce that magnetic field uh, uh, of the plasma. We do pay for it with a higher current complexity, but that is not as big as a cost in uh, in our coil manufacturing paradigm as if you need to create these uh, coils as 3D sculptures. We can just draw this complex pattern. Uh, so, and even better results can be achieved. This was just taking the uh, the the these envelopes, but these surfaces can be further optimized. So we're looking into a joint method similar to the work of uh, Elizabeth Paul that we all know uh, to optimize, uh, use uh, shape gradients to optimize the shape of the boundary. And we're applying that to a constraint optimization problem of piecewise cylinder. So change the cross-sectional shape and change the location and orientation of these cylinders as a very constrained optimization problem to find the orientation of the surface that has a minimal coil complexity, as well as other metrics that we can include in this optimization. In addition, the current doesn't need to be uh, uh, constrained. We can inject current at different locations and extract them at other locations from the coil winding surface. So. We are looking at solving the the uh, record like problem, but then by including sources and sinks where we inject the current and extract the current from the surface to give us more freedom and get even better current solutions on these simplified coil winding surfaces. Uh, now the next step is making uh, the stellarator smaller. And we all know that that uh, can be done by increasing the magnetic field strength. Here is a comparison of ITER, which uh, aims for a Q of 10 uh, uh, with a magnetic field of 5.3 Tesla, and the ARC reactor, which uh, doubles the field strength and therefore gets almost a four times reduction in size uh, by going to 9.3 Tesla. So um, the same is true for the stellarator. If we uh, take the projection, uh, the Helios uh, stellarator, uh, the Helios reactor at five Tesla is uh, projected to need to be 22 meters in major radius. Now, if we can do the same 
trick with the magnetic field strength. So we double the magnetic field strength to 10 Zesla. We will also need to increase the uh, aspect ratio of the plasma equilibrium as well in order to, uh, via the ISS 4 scaling, get a little bit uh, safer. But then we believe that we can take the, uh, make a fusion reactor, a power plant with uh, six meter major radius and, and simplified coil. So this is a picture of W7X, but uh, uh, we'll take different coils for this. Uh, now, going much higher in magnetic field, it also increases greatly the forces that the coils experience. And this is some other work that we have uh, uh, performed uh, recently in collaboration with mathematicians from uh, the Paris Sorbonne University. So the recoil algorithm solves for uh, the current pattern on the coil widening surface uh, with a regularization on the current complexity. But we can add other interesting regularization terms to this uh, optimization. Um, the mathematics of this has been uh, uh, worked out by our mathematics collaborators. But importantly here, we can include a regularization term that directly targets the Lorentz force on the surface. And not just as a uh, absolute squared metric, but we also implemented it with a nonlinear cutoff. So the penalty function uh, is basically zero if your forces on your surface are below a certain value. And then they, uh, the penalty that is included increases exponentially, uh, well, faster than exponentially. It increases to infinity before uh, you reach a second cut of value. And so this way you can ensure that your current record current solution doesn't contain any forces larger than your cutoff value. And, um, and so this is, uh, well, here on the right, we see these solutions uh, in, uh, uh, yeah, in, uh, we get the same magnetic field accuracy on the plasma surface, but we get a, a strong reduction by almost a factor of two in uh, the, in the total force, uh, in the maximum force. So by including extra terms in this uh, objective function, we can find current solutions and we can find that trade-off not only between current complexity, but also between uh, uh, the Lorentz forces on that surface. Uh, Chris? Yes. Uh, what, so uh, what, is, what is the limit on, on the force? Oh, in other words, you've got this superconductor in these grooves uh, yes. on the surface. Is it is the is the limit have have something to do with bending the actual the full surface or does it have to do with the, the when the superconductor is going to pop out of the grooves because of the force? Uh, so the limit is uh, we we do run especially if you go to ten Tesla stellarators against the limits of steel. Uh, it can only so uh, Francesco maybe can I hand this uh, question over to you. Yeah, with pleasure, yeah. So, um, okay, first of all, I should make a quick clarification uh, because I believe Ari is under the impression that uh, the superconductor is in the grooves. In reality, what we do is we have these big surfaces uh, coated with HTS and uh, we selectively remove uh, HTS from these surfaces and so we uh, corrugate the surfaces, we remove HTS. So uh, there is HTS everywhere except then in the grooves. Okay. Okay. So that's yeah. different from, let's say, the CFS approach, which maybe you were referring to. Uh, so now we have this coating similar to, you know, coating, uh, painting, uh, a car painting, a paint job on a car. So there is this uh, film um, deposited on a large metallic surface, but this film, uh, is subject to very strong J. Crispy forces. And um, there are two issues here. Um, one, as you uh, correctly uh, pointed out, it can pop out from the, uh, it can detach from the substrate. Uh, basically, right. if the bonding forces of the film on the surface are not enough, it can detach from the surface. In reality, the bonding forces with our process uh, are expected to be uh, sufficient to withstand that. 
uh, the, the the other issue, uh, which is the one that prompted this job on the force minimization, is that, okay, now you have the superconducting film tightly bound on the metallic substrate, so they move together, uh, but they move together under the effect of very strong forces. So your, uh, your um, structural material is being subject to these huge forces, uh, these huge Jacobs B forces. And uh, right. this, basically the material is subject to the hoop force, uh, and is subject to other deformations, um, and the, the cylindrical surface uh, is trying to deform under the effect of these surfaces. Um, you can prevent such examine, deformation. You can prevent you examine it to finish. Sorry. You, you can prevent such deformation by adopting a thick enough metal substrate, uh, but for cost reduction, we prefer to be more elegant and you know reduce the forces and therefore the required uh, thickness of the substrate for the same amount of desired deformation or tolerable deformation. Okay, so you've examined for both of these limits and 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 it's and both of them are satisfied, right? Yes, the limits on the yeah on the bounding and on the deformation. Yes, and it is one of them. Does one of them tend to be? The, the more serious limit, and the other one is uh, practically negligible or, or oh, incomparable? Or... Um, the C0 and C1 here in this plot, is, is this what you're referring to? The soft limit? I'm, and not the referring, limit? I'm referring to the two types of limits that you were just addressing. Yeah, one okay. Is, all right, okay, okay. Sorry for the, yeah, maybe I caused uh, some confusion. Okay, so there are two. Um, okay, the, um, at the end of the day, even though you, has, you have these two uh, issues, uh, the film peeling away from the substrate, issue one, or the, right. the, the film and the substrate moving too much, issue two, mm -hmm. these two issues mm -hmm. translate into combined together in a single um, hard limit. Okay, what we call our limit, the maximum force that we can tolerate, C1, the value that uh, Chris is pointing at with the mouse. Uh, in this limit, uh, again, I, I emphasize, uh, is not so much the binding uh, issue, is that the other one is the deformation that, that contributes to this limit, but it's a single limit, hard limit. There is some degree of arbitrariness in how you choose C0, so it's basically a safety margin. And uh, we we roughly want to stay a factor of two away from that uh, hard limit. So C um, naught is semi arbitrary. So to say, C one is more rigidly, more um, uh, quantitatively uh, defined. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Let's. Uh, are there any other questions? I, I think can, we'll uh, move ahead. I want to make sure, Chris, you have enough time to present. Yes. So we'll yeah, I should uh, continue because I have uh, a few more slides. And uh, um, so, yes, uh, the types of the so we're planning to uh, make the stellarator using these grooves, and this requires a new way of modeling uh, coils. Actually, filamentary approaches don't work as well. We need to solve the currents in between these grooves. So we need to solve a two D problem of finding what is the actual path that the current takes in between these grooves. Uh, and well, supercurrents can take uh, a lot of tricks. Sometimes it concentrates around the edges uh, of, of a conductor. So that's uh, what we're working on uh, right now, uh, uh, modeling the current distribution inside of a grooved surface. Uh, here we started with uh, conformal grooved surfaces, but we are expanding this to uh, uh, piecewise cylindrical surfaces as well uh, that contain saddle coils and complex solutions. Um, and then at the same time, we also need to, uh, or the the stellarator scaling uh, shows us that the higher aspect ratio we can make the configuration, the better it performs. And at the same time, uh, we want it to uh, fit well with the conformal cylindrical surfaces that we plan to put around it. Uh, so we are working on uh, generating new equilibria based also on the HSR line. Uh, so this is an expanded uh, fattened HSR4 equilibrium with a low aspect ratio 
a high magnetic field. So our equilibrium physicist Echeleas is uh, working on these equilibria and analyzing their their properties and optimizing their shapes at the moment. Uh, so at the same time, we also need to find the set of parameters, the magnetic field strength, the radius, the uh, power that is needed to make the most cost-effective power plant uh, that uh, we can. And this is something that uh, our uh, mechanical engineer, Victor Prost, is working on uh, using uh, the scaling to find the most cost-effective uh, stellarator, um, mostly a 1D approach uh, using the ISS 4 scaling. Um, so, uh, but yeah, we need to get the most, uh, most not only the best accelerator, but also the most cost effective uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, yeah, all of the components that are needed. Uh, now, the last uh, uh, step is to make it safer as well. So to stop the neutrons from the DT reactions uh, from happening. And here, our simplified manufacturing approach helps us a lot, again, because it's much easier to stabilize a flow of a liquid metal uh, against a cylindrical substrate again. Um, so this is uh, something that, in fact, we have even done. This is an experiment that Francesco performed in Colombia uh, with magnets around the side here and a flow of gallanston. So that's not lithium, but uh, gallanston. But you can translate uh, uh, the parameters of one equation to an equivalent uh, thickness uh, of uh, lithium. And... Uh, Turning on currents can cause the foreign Lorentz force to stabilize the flow against the wall. So we have this control over the current that we run through the liquid metal, the magnetic field itself, which is also produced by uh, superconductors and has a very high strength, mostly parallel to the cylinder. With uh, um, This can stabilize a relatively thick, a mesoscale thickness liquid metal wall against the inside of the cylinder. And such a liquid metal wall doesn't deteriorate. Uh, it's made of lithium or lithium hydride and uh, it can uh, absorb the neutrons before they even reach the superconductor on the outside of the cylinder. So we did some studies on scaling the thickness. Uh, so some Monte Carlo uh, neutronic simulations uh, where we look at the effect of different thicknesses of uh, lithium hydride at different concentrations of lithium and hydride. Um, this is also something that uh, we are patenting and uh, patents have recently been submitted. But um, in order to stop the neutrons, the uh, most efficient way is by inelastic scattering with something with the same mass. So lithium hydride, even high concentration of the hydride, is a very effective uh, stopper of neutrons before they hit the wall. And here we look at the total neutron flux in percent versus the thickness with, uh, well, with a first wall consisting of lead, but this is not a wall. We are envisioning that in this liquid metal flow, we can add uh, certain components such as uh, um, pebbles that uh, can be hollow and that can float on the inside of the surface of the wall and uh, do the first uh, reduction in energy of the neutrons. And then they pass through the lithium hydride and uh, then we can block a sufficient amount of them in order for the plant to have a five-year lifespan given by this uh, green bar here. Um, uh, and uh, well, we find that it's most effective using 95% lithium hydride. There's also a very interesting uh, phase diagram that lithium hydride has because it comes in different phases at different temperatures. Uh, so at above 700 degrees Celsius, all of it is in the alpha phase, but there's also uh, portions of the uh, diagram where it has both a liquid and a solid phase, alpha and beta, in which one, the beta phase, is much higher in lithium hydride. So this gives us a way to separate the lithium hydride. And even if we use, and this is something we're investigating right now with the DOE uh, infused grant together with uh, Savannah River, we're investigating if we can use the 
isotopic effect in the difference of mass between deuterium and uh, hydrogen and tritium in order to, if we very accurately um, uh, manage the temperature, can targetedly precipitate the beta, the hydride-rich phase, but even targetedly precipitate the tritium uh, and the deuterium separate from the, the hydride. Uh, forms and so uh, facilitate the tritium extraction from the the liquid metal, which also forms the working fluid. So as it passes through the stellarator, it is heated up by the neutrons, and then we extract that heat. We turn it into useful work, but we also uh, pass through this phase transition and enable the separation of the hydride rich and possibly even isotopically enriched uh, portions of this fluid. So then the last step is to uh, make it uh, uh, faster and cheaper. In order for a uh, fusion power plant to be a uh, 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 the, the game changer that it needs to be to mitigate climate change, uh, it needs to, and this is according to ARPA E recommendations, uh, have less than 2 billion capital cost, and the energy should be less than $5 per watt uh, or less than $50 per megawatt hour of energy produced. Now that is something that is not reached for the uh, uh, plants such as uh, demo, which are first of a kind and, and very expensive, but we believe that we can uh, aim for these targets uh, in, uh, in our power plant with the simplified construction and uh, the other um, the other technologies we're showing. So this is our roadmap to fusion. Uh, and we're halfway here into the first phase, into the enabling phase. Uh, and uh, this is where startups make the big promises, uh, but uh, we need to go for it now. And we need to do this in the next, uh, well, decade or so in order to make this uh, dent in climate change. But yeah, we're here in the first phase and we're still small. We're 11 people right now, but we're enabling, we're showing our technology. So we are uh, working on manufacturing our first HTS. Uh, we're working on showing the stabilization of the free flowing liquid metal in order to protect from the neutrons. These um, also have a potential spin-offs with the HTS that we can manufacture. We can uh, make energy storage devices or MRIs, uh, other uh, potential applications. And we can demonstrate the stabilization of thick liquid metal walls that are able to block the neutrons. And at the same time in this phase, we're working on the equilibrium, the design of the stellarator and the modeling of it, so that when we reach the end of the phase, we can start building. And we want to start building um, high field stellarators with the uh, superconducting coils that we are by then making. In, um, we want to uh, make uh, a few experiments uh, specifically to mitigate the risk for when we go for the power plant. We want to measure confinement at high field and extend the stellarator scaling so that we can have high confidence that the large device that we make will make a functioning power plant. And the geometry of these intermediate devices is something that we want to do together with the community uh, uh, to um, run these experiments uh, and uh, get your input on what are the most ex important experiments to run here. At the same time, in this phase, we're scaling up. So we're making larger and larger cylinders so that when we get to the point where we want to deploy, deploy or electrify, we are making these large HDS coded cylinders that can be shipped directly to either an end of life fission or, uh, uh, or carbon plant and can replace the dirty or the end of life core with, uh, with a stellarator heat source that can, uh, generate uh, electricity. And so that's, we can directly start delivering energy to the grid and start transitioning away from carbon sources. So yeah, this is uh, our team.
uh, Francesco and me, we're on the call here, uh, but we also have Simon and uh, Diego on board as a chief projects officer and chief operations officer. And of course, all of the work that I presented is uh, done by, by all of our people, Achilleas, who uh, is our equilibrium physicist, uh, our HCS team, uh, Medi, who designs the MOCVD machines that are going to produce the superconductor, Lorenzo, who designs the shapes of the magnets and other spin-off uh, applications that we're working on, our engineering team and our liquid metal team. And we're looking for a lot of new people, uh, specifically, uh, uh, well, there's, um, we opening uh, about 15 jobs, uh, many of which could be of interest to people here in, uh, in this audience. So if you know anyone, or if you would like to help us build Stellarator, uh, please uh, give me or Francesco a call. We're looking for heads of fusion science, fusion engineering, uh, of uh, cross-functional engineering, and uh, uh, fusion enabling uh, research, so the HTS and liquid metal components. We're looking for the plasma group leaders, the uh, group leader to lead the uh, coil winding service and groove optimization. Uh, Stability physicists, transport and confinement, burning plasma. Basically, we will be uh, growing uh, very much in the future, and we're looking to get as many people on board as possible. Um, so, yeah, please contact uh, me or Francesco if you know anyone interested in helping us uh, build the Stellarator. Of course, we're also working together with a lot of uh, uh, researchers, and here's a brief overview of the people in uh Europe that we're working together with. Uh, so I mentioned uh, a few times the collaboration with the mathematicians uh, at in RIA at Sorbonne, Strasbourg, uh, and Ecole Polytechnique. They have helped us a lot with uh, formulating the mathematics of this optimization problem. We're working together with uh, uh, Rogério and Paolo at uh, Lisbon on uh, fast particle tracking. We're working together with uh, Frédéric Brochard and Lorraine on uh, stabilizing liquid metal flows. And with the University of uh, Tusia, we're working on generative design, machine learning. Um, in the US, we have a lot of uh, collaborations as well, uh, some of uh, whom are here on the uh, on this call as well. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, important collaboration here as well is with Venkat Salvamankam, uh, who uh, is uh, our advisor on the HDS uh, manufacturing part. And uh, he uh, holds the record for highest critical current density uh, superconductor uh, deposited. Uh, so, and it's his grad student who took part in that experiment, who is now helping us design the machines to build our Stellarator coils. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks to all of our collaborators that make it possible uh, to uh, make uh, make this uh, uh, project and uh, our strategic, uh, strategic committee as well, who gives us advice also on how to integrate with the uh, um, with uh, government uh, and uh, uh, yeah. So that brings me to the very end of the talk. Thank you all very much for your attention and uh, please uh, I'll uh, take questions now. Sorry for going a little bit over time. No problem. Thank you, uh, Chris and Francesco. Um, any questions? Raise hands. I was looking at the uh, questions. Adele Wright has a question. Do you foresee any cost challenges associated with access once the device is assembled, as for example, for maintenance or the liquid metal walls? Um, so any cost challenges associated with access? Well, the nice thing with the liquid metal is uh, once if the machine is down, all of the metal is out of the machine. So it's much easier to access than with a, a blanket that, that is, is solidly put in place. Also, go, using uh, thick liquid metal walls reduces uh, cost a lot because there is no structural damage to the liquid metal part. Uh, it's only after it has been passed with the liquid metal that it reaches solid materials that get activated and that need replacement. Uh, so it's not with, uh, at least the liquid metals are not the, the challenge to 
to Axis. Uh, we are covering most of the coil winding surface with superconductor though. So Axis will be much more limited than on an experimental device or on a device that consists of um, uh, separate coils uh, where you can access in between the coils. Uh, we need to make dedicated ports uh, where we can't put superconductor. But yeah, that has advantages in many ways, but it does make access more difficult. Thank you. Joaquim. Yeah, thank you, Chris. This was fantastic. Uh, very beautiful ideas. Um, about the power exhaust, I was wondering how important it is the design of the magnetic uh, field or the magnetic topology at the edge in terms of controlling power exhaust. Is it you don't care too much, like you can run with a limited configuration or do you have also some ideas for how to channel the heat? So it's again the liquid metal walls that uh, form a panacea for many of the issues because the liquid metal itself doesn't have an issue with a power density per square meter because it's flowing and you can increase, of course, within limits, but uh, that, that limit is much further away than if you have a solid plasma phasing component. Right. There so is, so you, don't, you don't need any specific design or, I don't know, scenario development, detachment, I don't know. So there is, a, I, yeah, I'm looking for collaboration on this issue because this is not my expertise, but uh, I, uh, with detached plasmas uh, or, or with a diverter uh, stellarator design, you can uh, get a better plasma performance uh, probably uh, than, uh, so you can get possibly into an H mode type of running, which I don't think will be possible with a limited uh, configuration. So there are some reasons to go for a, uh, well, to, to design your edge so that you have either an island diverter or something that can help you set up uh, a, a better pressure gradient at the plasma boundary than if you're just uh, using a, a relying on on the liquid wall to be a limiter but you don't have the big issues with uh power density on the liquid metal again um yeah did that answer okay. your question yes yes thank you thomas oh yeah thank you very much for this inter very interesting and exciting talk i think the main innovation i see here which um, i find very intriguing <clears throat> is the use of these grooves to define a barrier for the current channel. Um, and I was just wondering, I was thinking about how do you actually induce the current in this layer? How do you, uh, is there a need to control the currents? Is there a need to have different layers have different uh, current densities, et cetera? How do you control this magnetic configuration? Is this purely a geometric thing? Um, and in terms of the engineering and the startup, how do you actually induce the currents? So we will need to deposit more than just a single layer of uh, superconductor. And we're still working on, so the machines aren't, aren't finished yet. So we, we're still working on, are we going to make, uh, make it like a spiral with a thick layer uh, uh, of uh, silver in between? Or are we going to uh, make a white carpet that we roll around. Uh, there are different uh, ways to solve it, but we will need to wrap the current around several times. And so each band between two grooves will have several layers of superconductor that need to be powered on the inside layer and then go around several times around the stellarator and then be extracted from the top layer. Um, so the exact design of the leads is still uh, Work in progress. That, uh, uh, but uh, Chris, if I can expand on your yes. answer, uh, and in this um, um, portfolio of options that we have, another intriguing option that we are considering is uh, inducing persistent modes uh, in the in the superconductor. 
Um, there are ways of energizing a superconducting coil and detach the power supply and let the current flow in the coil forever, uh, or not even not even using a power supply in the first place, inductively uh, load the circuit. So there are techniques called flux pumping, um, uh, yeah, persistent modes. There are there are ways to do it. Uh, it has never been done on this scale, but on a smaller scale, it has been achieved. Mm -hmm. And that would be ideal. You turn the accelerator on, you disconnect it, and it runs. Uh... Um, okay. Well, I, uh, I know that works. Yeah. I have a computer. I have a superconducting magnet a few hundred, a hundred meters from me right now that does that. Um, so the pers persistent mode thing. Uh, but um, I, did I understand you right that you actually need to have several layers? Uh, so it will still have kind of like a coil-like structure in the current path. And, and if so. Does this mean now that you have you can't just rely on the strength of the uh, material that's underneath, but you uh, have to worry about delamination between these different layers of current? Is that true? Chris, do you so, want me to take this one or? Um, uh, yes, yes, if you would. Uh... Okay, so can you go to the slide? Uh, can you go to the animation? Uh, the second, uh, the video, actually. Um, the um, film not the film deposition video, <clears throat> the separate video, the separate file for our okay. process. Yes. Uh, so I, I'm sorry for. Yeah, if you can go. No, keep, keep going back, please. No, back, back. Okay. You, uh, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. That's the perfect slide. Okay. So that sequence uh, in the. Um, uh, that sequence in the red uh, enclosure on the left. So you see, you see some layers in a blue box uh, in the castle on the left, and some layers in a red box. Mm -hmm. the, the layers in the blue box are um, um, spattered in uh, and ion beam assisted deposited in a cold machine. The layers in the red box are uh, deposited in this uh, hot machine that uh, uh, Chris is showing now. The sequence, the red sequence, is repeated over and over between 20 and 40 times. And uh, what uh, prevents uh, delamination is the fact that the last layer of sequence N is uh, epitaxially grown uh, by chemical vapor deposition and serves as a good substrate to initiate the sequence N plus 1. So typically, silver in these tapes is deposited by sputtering. But the novelty here is that uh, we, we, by using MSTVD, we um, get a texture, uh, epitaxial, uh, well-behaved, you know, well, well, um, a good crystal, basically, that we use as the basis for the magnesium oxide uh, for the following sequence. And that prevents uh, the delamination issue that, Thomas, you are uh, correctly pointing out. Okay. And you, so you're using magne magnesium oxide as your uh, superconductor. No, magnesium oxide Repco. is a buffer. The Repco that's, is the that's superconductor. The it's the Repco you're using as the superconductor. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the magnesium oxide is the textured interface layer that causes, uh, well, with the LMO in between, that causes the Repco to grow in the right crystalline structure so that you have the highest IC. Okay. Thomas, may I suggest uh, that we follow up on some of your yeah. very interesting questions in the interest of time, but we have a little bit more time Let I'll return to you. Yeah. Uh, Alan? Yeah, well, I, I'm liquid metal holding it on the wall, you're flowing it so slowly that it doesn't do any, the motion doesn't modify the field. It seems rather complicated to get the field necessary to hold the liquid on stably. And the field the stellar needs inside it. They, they somehow look like they would fight each other a bit. Can you comment on how you put the two together? Uh, the liquid metal and the. Uh, well, so... you're using magnetic fields to hold the liquid metal on, the J cross B force to hold the liquid metal on the wall. And you're also trying to get fields through that from the coils to the stellarator. Uh, and so, it, of course, it's only the fields on the stellar I care about as a plasma physicist. Um, and how do, I, how do I do that coupled problem? Yes, that you are indeed uh, pointing out a, uh, a, a challenge that we <laughs> still need to face. Uh, but we, uh, so if this was a tokamak, it would be simple. Uh, we can just 
flow the fluid poloidally. For the stellarator magnetic field, we will need to choose the angle that the liquid flows around in order to uh, uh, get. So the magnetic field will be predominant, predominantly, especially close to the wall, it will be predominantly uh, perpendicular to the wall though it will have a com component normal to it in order to shape uh, the plasma. But um, I mean, yeah, we think we can uh, shape the flow. Not, it's not going to be purely poloidal, but it's going to flow the, uh, follow the magnetic field. You say, um, I think you, you said it backwards. The, flow, the field near the wall is presumably tangential to first order and then smaller perpendicular terms. Yeah, yes, tangential is what yeah. I mean. Sorry, yeah. I stated that wrong. And your and your flow will be so slow that the field can penetrate to this layer before the flow has gone a big distance compared to variations. Uh, if the flow is fast, of course, it gets you start excluding the field uh, in a funny way. There, there will be some field dragging effects. Um, there will also be some current running through the liquid metal as well in order to add a little bit extra J cross B force and ensure that the current neatly sticks to the wall. Um, yes, the there will be a small modification of the magnetic field due to that. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, the question is how big is it? I mean, if it's a flow or infinitesimal speed, then of course you can run currents through the flow if you have insulated walls or something. But there are a lot of subtleties even in that, how the current path goes through the liquid metal versus the stainless steel and all of that. But anyway, that's... Uh, um, uh, yeah. Francesco, do you have any comments on this? The, the current needed to stabilize the uh, liquid metal, though, is orders of magnitude lower than the current uh, that needs to run through the, uh, the plasma, uh, the coil winding surface. So it, it's going to be... There will be a, a small effect, uh, but um, uh, Francesco, do you have any comments on this? Yeah, quick comment. Uh, so um, we are not talking about huge velocities. Um, well, first of all, they are dictated mostly by uh, how much heat we need to remove. Um, and so depending on the particular design, because again, there is a, uh, fortunately, there is a broad um, um, design space. So... Uh, in passing, Chris was showing that slide on system analysis. Uh, so our brilliant colleague, uh, Victor, um, studied combinations of R&B, major radius and field, um, which uh, uh, to design our reactor. And for, a dif for different choices, you have different requirements in terms of flow velocity of the liquid metal. But we are talking meters per second. Um, which is actually not that huge. If you compute uh, V vector B, you don't get a huge electromotive force. So um, we don't expect this to be a problem. And um, uh, another question, slightly related, uh, because you know I, I, they often ask me, uh, but you have these rigid uh, superconducting coils, but effectively the liquid metal is also a coil. There is a current flowing in the coil and this is a deformable coil. And so how can you accurately generate your stellarator field and uh, keep it uh, as such in time? Uh, the, that's a very good point, uh, but we should remember that we have uh, tens of megaamps uh, in the rigid coils external, the superconductors, and we have only a few kiloamps for the same amount of, uh, you know, um, per length. Uh, um, so it's tens of kiloamps versus few kiloamps. And, and these are a rigid, very high current filament attracting a deformable uh, 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 current filament, but uh, carrying a much lower current, orders of magnitude lower. And as we know, currents flowing in the same direction attract each other. The thing here is that you have these rigid coils, uh, HTS coils on the outside, which are attracting towards the outside um, the the formable uh, currents, um, the, the, the formable current carrying uh, medium, uh, namely the liquid metal. Uh, I but I want to emphasize see, oh, this difference in order of magnitude. I also see a comment from uh, Xiao Zhang uh, on uh, this uh, with the three D magnetic field. Uh, will the liquid 
while be homogenous or will it lead to anisotropic uh, or, or different thicknesses at different locations? Uh, Amitava, uh, can we talk about the way that we uh, intend to uh, sure. homogenize uh, this uh, you, to stabilize I, 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 the? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I had the feeling that you were working on the problem too, which is why I responded yes. on your behalf because I also see your it's. Uh, but surely, please give a brief answer and we'll take your question as the last one. Uh, it's already 9.14. And you can see the excitement your talk has engendered, which is a very positive thing. Go ahead, Chris. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, um, the current, uh, this is a simplified contune here, but one of the processes that we're also uh, patenting is not just stabilization by a single uh, two current leads, one at the top and one at the bottom, but we can actually induce uh, put different voltages at different locations in the liquid metal film and thereby induce local currents that push the film so that we get a homogeneous thickness this is still in process uh, of uh, we're still working this out but there are ways it's not just going to be inhomogeneous we have ways of controlling the liquid metal over the entire surface even with 3d magnetic fields so, uh, Joret, uh, is your Joret. question in the comments or? Um... No, he's uh, no, asking. He has his hands raised. I have a related yes. question. I have a related question, actually. Um, you said, I think you said uh, that you have forty-five centimeters of this liquid uh, flow around the the vessel. Forty-five. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, like all the other designs I've seen so far, they uh, need a lot more. So how can you get away with only 45 centimeter thick uh, walls? What is your nutrient influence in the in the coils? This is probably the limiting factor for you. So um, the the trick here is to um, so the much larger thickness one and a half meter is for pure lithium, I believe. Um, the trick here is to use lithium hydride. So how do you most effectively stop a neutron? Well, you first need to get it from high energy to lower energy, but then the low energy uh, interactions, the reaction, the interaction cross section is highest for something if the two particles have equivalent mass. Now, what has equivalent mass to a neutron? A hydrogen atom. So having lithium hydride and your bulk material, the hydride is really good at stopping the neutrons, at least from medium energy onto the energy where they're absorbed by the lithium and breed tritium. Uh, so if we look at the uh, reaction here, so that's why we do model a first layer of lead in this simplified model, this, this onion model of um, the uh, blanket. Uh, the lead uh, helps initially uh, reduce the highest energy of neutrons, but very quickly in the lithium hydride, we see that uh, uh, we, sorry, I am flipping around too much. Uh, uh, the lithium hydride is really efficient at taking the intermediate energy of neutrons and uh, moving them to low enough energies to be absorbed by uh, and, and breed tritium. Um, so yeah, that that is the the magic here using lithium hydride uh, because the hydrogen is really efficient at uh, inelastic scattering with the neutrons. And you're breeding enough tritium with this? Um, yes, I don't have that in this slide, but uh, Francesco, do you remember what the tritium breeding ratio was for? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's um, again for different choices of thickness that you're showing in this graph is between 1.2 and 1.5. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. With all lithium 6, I, I assume. No, no, this is naturally occurring lithium. Uh... Okay. Was that, uh, Francesca? I don't remember if the 1.2 to 1.5 was also true for the. Uh, uh, Naturally occurring lithium six. That's, lithium that's for the natural right? lithium. Yes. Uh, okay. You, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Interesting. We can send you some some graphs if you want, Jared. Yeah, that would be interesting. Thanks. So Francesco, as well as uh, Chris, have posted their email address at Renaissance 
on the website, uh, you will find that along with the abstract. Um, Francesco and Chris, will it be possible for us to have a copy of your presentation? You have a number of things which have patent spending, so I ask <laughs> with caution. That's up, entirely up to you. It's a request. Uh, I, I think there is no, I think there is no issue. So yeah, we, yeah, we can send you the slides, sum it up, and you can uh, circulate them. Yeah, sure, and we'll send it uh, with your permission. Uh, typically, Lance Bedden posts it on the website of Hidden Symmetries, which you should be aware is public domain. Um, so uh, whatever version you have, uh, clearly the talk has engendered a lot more. Uh, questions than we have had time to answer. So I thank you, Chris and Francesco, for a very exciting presentation. There's been such a spell of silence, and you've been working really, really hard for a group of 11 people to have done this amount of work. It is really very impressive. I uh, really wish you the very best, and I hope you can get to that number of 50 uh, that you're striving to. Uh, yeah, yeah. You need all of it. Yes, this is great. Fantastic. And that's just the beginning. So Yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Very exciting for all of us. Thank you. And keep Thanks, uh, up the open channel of communication. That'll be really great. We certainly I, will. Yes. Yeah, now that we're much more free to talk and uh, now that the patents uh, are out, uh, we're happy to enlist as much help. We're going to build the accelerator together. It's not going to be us, like the entire community, uh, we want yeah. Uh, to, uh, yeah. I hope so. Thanks Amitabha, so do, can I have literally one minute? I know you know. Oh, yeah, close. absolutely. It's, it's super late, ahead. but, uh, but um, uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, in the interest of time, uh, Chris said to go quickly through that slide entitled Roadmap, uh, but you, but he, he mentioned and you saw. Uh, uh, the a scale up phase in which yes. we will learn how to make bigger and bigger cylinders, and correspondingly, we can build uh, larger and larger stellarators until eventually a power plant. Um, before going to a power plant, I think the focus here should be, and I hope we can all agree, public and private uh, partners, on the importance of the next step stellarator. And uh, we can all agree, I hope, on the importance to go to higher field and uh, on the interesting science that awaits us um, in uh, HTS stellarators, uh, possibly uh, uh, with liquid metal walls. So uh, those two or three uh, uh, mid-scale devices, mostly for uh, research, that are meant to inform the final power plant will probably be in different symmetries uh, because there is not uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, work on um, high field stellarators in the various symmetries. And uh, again, there is a lot of interesting physics uh, uh, I'm preaching to the choir that can be done at high fields and uh, comparing the, you know, a quasi isodynamic, a quasi axisymmetric, and a quasi helical concept. It would be very nice since we have to, in the process of improving and scaling up our technology. Uh, we need to build these larger and larger coils uh, anyway, larger and larger cylinders anyway. It would be nice for the first iteration to make them with a particular symmetry, for the second iteration with a different symmetry, and for the third one with yet another symmetry. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are not just engineering tests. They could be operated as plasma experiments, but yet we are not a plasma institute. So if plasma research institutes are interested in this idea that I'm just pitching uh, and they want to... Um, guide us, let's say, in uh, how to um, guide us in, in the uh, fields that we want to uh, generate. And correspondingly, we can work out what grooves would generate such fields. That would be fantastic. And it could be a win-win situation. Yeah, it's an excellent so, physics idea. Could I ask you very quickly, um, do you have funding already available for building such a mid-size experiment? Or are you looking for it? in collaboration with institutions and agencies? Uh, so we have, uh, we are, we, we make an announcement of funding soon. Um, it's not uh, in, uh, to the point of building uh, a stellarator yet, um, but, but uh, we have some exciting news coming up. Um, the, the next step would be indeed to build a stellarator, starting with a small one. 
and uh, that can be done uh, in collaboration with public partners. I was actually asking you about your cylindrical flow experiments. You, oh, yeah. that one, for that one, um, so, so in, in that one, we also welcome collaborations, if that's the question. Yes. And, and on the funding, uh, I, I would rather not answer yet. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but, thank but you. But you at least have a pathway there. I'm pleased to hear that. And the fact that you want to play around with different symmetries. Oh, so yes. You oh, totally. That, you, you foresee that happening over the period of three to five years. Is that correct? If I saw where you are in your roadmap. The, pro the, the very first uh, demonstration of the HTS plus liquid metal, the integration of the HTS and liquid metal technologies, uh, yes. And that's roughly the time when we will start building. As soon, that's the, my, the stepping stone, you know, to, to, to then start building the first accelerator. The idea is demonstrate a single cylinder first and then go into building many of them and connecting them together to form a, a Stellarator. Hmm. Really interesting plan, Francesco. Really interesting. Uh, I, I'm very excited by what you and Chris talked about today. Very nice. Thanks a lot. And we have a great team, uh, um, you know, um, uh, helping us in this. So, all right. Okay. Well, thank you very, thank much, you very much, everybody. Um, our emails are in the chat. Uh, looking forward to yeah. talking further. Yeah. All right. Thanks Take again. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you all for coming. Thomas, your hand is still up. I, I am uh, perfectly willing to go back. Oh, you're clapping. No, I, I, I okay. Thank you, Thomas. I thought Thanks that I everyone. didn't give you quite enough time to ask all the questions you had, but you know how to reach these people. So... Uh, Take care, my friends. Very, very nice to see all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.